So hi, welcome to the Good Noise Podcast. I'm Shane. I'm Glory. And we're here with... I'm Mike from Pianos Become the Tease. And we asked them some questions today about their new album, Drift. So congrats on that, by the way. How do you feel about the response to the album so far? Uh, it's been awesome so far. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, every time you put out a new record, you kind of are waiting kind of on pins and needles to see what people think about what or where you're going as a band or especially with this record, I feel like, you know, we really try to stretch ourselves beyond just being kind of the band that we were before and, you know, really trying to explore a lot different sonics and things like that. So the response has been great though. I mean, we can't really ask for a better uh, fan base. That's been really accepting of kind of all the left turns we've taken them through. So this has been a, a really good, a good, uh, good response so far that's awesome i'm happy to hear that i bang yeah i really yeah, really you. enjoyed this record like a lot <laughs> thank you so much thank you yeah uh so is there any meaning behind the album title or cover art um so um especially with the title it kind of took some time to with most of our records i think lyrically stuff starts piecing together and start like kind of a puzzle starts coming together um, about midway through halfway through something like that. And we were writing a bunch and it seemed like um, a lot of the record kind of had this fever dream kind of quality to it. And it, fe it felt as though that like a lot of the, um, a lot of the songs kind of bled into each other. A lot of the lyrics kind of feature these ideas of kind of kind of floating drifting a lot of imagery that way and i don't know this record was kind of like really early on we kind of got that title almost right away and was like oh this this feels right and a lot of the mm -hmm. songs started falling into place it felt that like felt that way um and especially with the artwork our buddy august he's actually done every album cover we've done and um he and our other guitar player chad his wife would also be doing all the photographs for it but this go around we kind of wanted to do something that was a bit more designed something that felt a bit more um catching like right off the bat mm -hmm. and it really also didn't feel like a record that felt like a photo should represent it so kyle mm -hmm. and i kind of thought we were kind of spitballing ideas and we had these idea of like these lines that kind of distorted at some point within the like within the album cover itself and i wanted something that had this like continuity to the whole thing like if you open up the gatefold or the record you can see the lines run the whole way but there's like one little like blip that um you know kind of shows movement within the lines and it's not saying that there's any super dark hidden meaning or anything like mm -hmm. that. But I think uh, we really wanted something to where it had this like continuity and then an interrupt in the continuity. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of took on a life of its own when August started putting it together. And a lot of it now can kind of be interpreted in ways that we didn't necessarily in initially mean it to, but like mm -hmm. Kyle had brought up a good point where if you look at the album cover, it also kind of looks like two people underneath a sheet, like in a bed. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, you know works well with the album cover or the album content lyrics and stuff like that so um once we saw what august was working on for that it, it became pretty apparent that this was going to be um the album cover and it felt really right i think mm -hmm. the hardest thing was trying to choose color and like what it was going to look like but we knew we wanted something super vibrant and big so um yeah this is definitely the most like bright album cover we've ever done as a band especially for the album probably being the darkest of our albums too so mm -hmm. um yeah it was just something that really wanted something that was designed something kind of striking and timeless with our record covers i just never want something that's like you can look at it and know it came out at a certain time like yeah. i want to be able to look at it and know that it you know could live on forever you know way past us so absolutely for sure and on the topic of like the album titles, do you guys always kind of have that epiphany during your writing process of like, this is going to be the album title or was this like a, a unique scenario? Kind of. Yeah. I think some of them come at different times. Like our very first record, I don't think we really named until like it was just done. It was all totally done. All the song names were done. And then Kyle, Kyle's usually the one that comes up with the title or at least a few ranges of titles that we all then talk about 
like, oh, this feels right, this feels wrong or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, for the most part, it ends up being um, Kyle coming up with a few ideas that kind of lyrically, the, oh, oh, that'll tie in everything somewhat lyrically. So mm -hmm. um, the fact that Drift was kind of peppered throughout the whole record, there was a lot of nuance, like a lot of callbacks to songs previously on like the record there's a lot of shared lyrics a lot of shared stuff and when we were going through kind of just the continuity of the record and how it was sequenced and how it felt it was like yeah this is kind of the word that seems to be standing out both sonically as well as lyrically and, and it just it just felt right it was this is what yeah. this was probably the earliest one that we got that was like yeah this this feels like it's going to be the the title all right makes sense mm -hmm. um so can you tell us a little bit about your writing process for this album yeah um you know, it, it most of the writing process for our band is that we will um, come up kind of with, well, Chad and I playing guitar, um, we'll come up with a riff of something, bring it some everybody, and then we'll put it together and then pull it apart, put it together, pull it apart, and just keep doing it until we get to a place to where everybody's happy with the song. But this record was a little bit different. I feel like we started trying to come up with... Um, like, for example, the opening track on the record, Out of Sight, that actually started as just like a... Uh, this weird loop that Chad made that was a random generate generating loop mm -hmm. that you would basically pick. Um, you'd pick a key of something and then basically choose the kind of the division of the beat and, you know, what the sound was going to be. And it would basically create this random generating loop out of that. So he came up with this idea and we started toying around with this generation that was like, Oh, this is really cool. Um, I don't know how we're going to make this fit, though. And we actually came up. That actually was an idea back in like 2017 oh, that he had that he that he had sent. And I always kept it because I knew at some point we were going to be able to do something really cool with it. And there was just something really striking about it when he sent it, sent it over. So this record was a lot of trying to um, not necessarily not do the writing process that we would do before but i feel like really attempting to kind of throw every idea out there whether it's a weird random generating loop or a weird percussion thing that david would come up with or kyle would have a vocal idea that would be like oh that'd be kind of cool to manipulate this and then write around that so i think really this record um and i've said this a bunch like throughout the the kind of process of it is I feel like it needs to be ingested as like one big piece. Cause I mm -hmm. feel like most of the songs, I mean, there's songs obviously on there that are, you know, guitar driven or drum driven or things like that. But I feel like as a whole, the record itself is just kind of its own piece. Like it's this one big piece that kind of was a puzzle that we had to put together ourselves to figuring out what songs were going to be more guitar driven or what songs would be, um, you know, all vocals and we'll just kind of pepper in something that makes sense to be the the support for that so it was pretty it was similar to what we did before but i mean uh we also got to go away to my uncle's house for a while he has a, a house that's kind of in the middle of the woods in uh Basie, virginia and um it's this beautiful old cabin uh from the 70s that it's all round. The whole top of it has like these glass windows that just look into wow. the woods. And wow. we would just stay there for a week and uh, kind of eat, breathe, and write music. I mean, that was like the only thing that we did. We'd wake up, make breakfast, talk about demos, write all day, make lunch, talk about demos, rewrite, write them, go out, you know, make dinner. And this, you know, at the height of kind of COVID when there wasn't really, you know, there wasn't a ton of stuff that was like open or like mm -hmm. restaurants, stuff like that. So, we were kind of just left to our own devices for, you know, a few, you know, a week at a time here and there and just trying to like build the record that way. So it was definitely a cool process doing that. Hell yeah. I, I definitely agree with you when you kind of said that like this album is kind of meant to be digested as like one big whole piece. Cause I was like listening through some of the singles and I was just kind of sitting here kind of confused and it didn't really click for me until I heard the entire record. Yeah, and That's when <laughs> cool. I was really right. sold on, on the project as a whole. I was just very awesome. confused listening to the singles. <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, honestly, I feel like at least personally, I feel like, um, I never want to exist in like the lukewarm column for people. Like I want mm -hmm. people to be able to hear stuff that we do and either just totally not know what to do with it 
or really love it or want to spend time with it. And like, I feel like we're kind of a polarizing band in a lot of that stuff. Um, and I'm glad that this record seems to be the one that people are able to dive in and, you know, really see it as, as the whole that we intended it to be. Hell yeah. For sure. And actually, it sounds like you guys don't write in the studio. Is that a correct thing to assume? Like you usually just try to get everything together before you go in and then it's just kind of like recording or do you guys also write in the studio? Well, um, we don't really write in the studio. Um, we typically try to get the record to be, a, I mean, like 90 to 95% done before we're in the studio. Cause wow. we're also for better or for worse, we're also like extreme perfectionists between one another. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of that is, um, yeah, for better, or for worse. I mean, I think that we will not do too well sometimes in the studio if like we're just sitting there wasting time with a like money. you know and and that that's the biggest thing it's that like we there are times where we can go like an entire day at my uncle's house not writing anything or not nothing usable anyway like we'll come up with riffs and ideas and then there'll be a day where we can write two or three things at a time that just really feels like oh this is awesome mm -hmm. and it, it just feels like the pressure of sitting in the studio doing that is just not a good place for us to do we have written in the studio before um yeah. we wrote um there was a song on keep you called traces that we wrote um in the studio like that was something that we put together then but that's really been the only thing we've tried to put together some parts here and there in the studio mm -hmm. but not really whole songs um we're just not very good at that we tried that before and i think after you know, being a band for 15 years, it's like, yeah, I, th I think we've kind of gotten the groove of what we can do. And we're just not very good at doing it in the studio. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. When bands sure. tell us that they write like entire records in the studio, I'm like, that completely uh -huh. fascinates me because yeah. holy shit, like I could never yeah, write no under way. that kind of pressure. I couldn't yeah. do that. Yeah, no. I mean, I mean, I guess, well, I take it back. We definitely could, but we just overthink stuff. Yeah. Like we're, we're, we're constantly writing, like even on this record, we would finish a song and then somebody would say like you know i don't like the intro i think we should re-record the entire intro and like have to reset up all the drums all the bass and and lily just to re-record an intro of a song mm -hmm. and it's like that just doesn't usually bode too well when you have a like very defined amount of time that you're going to be in the studio absolutely mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, you guys have been a band for quite some time. And you also mentioned that uh, your writing process was a little bit different this time. You guys were just trying out different mm -hmm. things. Was that just to basically keep it interesting, keep it, you know, basically refresh the entire writing process for you guys? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think that um, especially for us as a band now, we're just, you know, we and I, I know every band and artist and stuff says this, but it's like, we, we really do kind of just write stuff for ourselves. We always want people to talk, like, like it, obviously, like there's, you know, you don't want people to hate what you do, but like, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we really, we really do like write solely for ourselves. And I think after being a band for so long, it's like, you can only just come to practice with a guitar riff and then put a drum part behind it and then a bass part and then vocals and be like, all right, there it is. Like there it is. we all have. Yeah, exactly. It's like that. It, there's there's not like it's not that that's not exciting because that part is exciting too but i think um all of us are also in vastly different like stylistically like the music that we listen to um i think there's a lot different stuff that interests us as artists now between one another you know like mm -hmm. obviously 10 15 years ago we were all on tour so much together that we all probably had a pretty shared taste of stuff we were listening to and sharing yeah. with one another. And you're in the band. So you're always playing something that somebody else is. Listening. So now that we're kind of, you know, not on tour as much and not, you know, doing as much together because, you know, we're all old. We all have like, you know, other lives outside of the band and things mm -hmm. like that, that we don't get to see each other that often. So we're all have it kind of experiencing our own life experiences. And yeah. that comes with, the stuff that we consume, be it art, movies, music, whatever. And I think a lot of those inspirations really have kind of led us into, oh, I really enjoy this artist right now. I'd love to make something that sounds like this. Like, yeah. um, even on this record, I mean, I was like trying to make like, I don't know if you're familiar with the artist Burial, but I was trying to do like a Burial track. Like that was like an all electronic UK garage-ish kind of thing that was like, oh, this would be really cool because that's the kind of stuff I'm super into. And then- yeah you know, Kyle's super into like 
something else. So his idea of trying to put a vocal on top of something like that and trying to just share those kind of influences, I think really kind of kept it fresh with us writing because, you know, 10 years ago, it would probably have been weird if somebody was like, oh, I have this idea with this synth part in this because <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't normal for us to to do that. But now that everybody is just kind of doing their own thing and, you know, has different interests and stuff, I think we try to bring all of those to the table and not let anything be off, um, kind of off limits. Like just let everybody do whatever the hell they want. And if it sounds cool and we'll use it. I mean, there's no, there's nothing that says, oh, this doesn't sound like a piano song because in reality, I... I don't even really know where we fit as a band. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, we're not a punk band. We're not an indie band. We're not a hardcore band. We're not a, you know, we're not in anything. We just kind of uh, uh, exist yeah. in some in some realm. So, especially now, we've just tried to embrace that kind of genreless thing that I think we're trying to just build stuff and make stuff that we like. For sure. And I love hearing that all of you have like different influences and things that you want to bring into music, because mm. if you didn't, as you mentioned, like 10 years ago, you guys listen to the same stuff. If you still totally, continue yeah. to do that, your music, like respectfully, it would have just turned into like mush because it would have just so, all totally. sounded the same. So now totally. that you guys have your own influences and you all listen to completely different things, it keeps your music evolving. It keeps you guys growing. I just that makes me happy to hear that you guys yeah. are like, sticking yourself in a box. Yeah, I feel like it's just not that fun to to just mm -hmm. like, I mean, there's always going to be, be the people that want us to write another lack long after another keep you another wait yeah. for a lot. It's like there's always going to be the people that want those records. But it's like, you, you don't want that. Like what you want is the feeling that you felt when you first heard those records. Exactly. You, yeah. Like you're you're nostalgic for something. You don't want the band to write the same record. You just mm -hmm. want that feeling back. And I could go on forever about that, like just kind of uh thing about people you know kind of chasing something that's more of a feeling of nostalgia rather than feeling like you know you, you don't want you want your bands and the things that you do to evolve but you you want it to like kind of evolve with you and you want to be able to have these like kind of emotional feelings every single time you listen to your favorite band and sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't but um i always want to be the artist that's continuing to just challenge you know, ourselves as a band, as well as like, I want to challenge our audience because they're getting older too. I mean, yeah. they're not, they're not, you know, 18 when we were 18 anymore. Like everybody, you know, they're all in their mid thirties as well, early forties. Like these are the people that are also evolving with you. And while some of them probably want, you know, a rehash of the same record over and over, it's like, I don't think that anybody would be excited about that. <laughs> There's also plenty of genres where you can go and get that. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or you can just go listen to the record that you really loved from the bands that you really love. Just listen to that. Like, yeah, you don't that's have, still there. You, yeah, exactly. It's still there. It didn't go away, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm I'm always for bands evolving. I love when a band, like, especially if a band just, like, swings for the, for the fences. And even if it's a miss or a home run or whatever, like, that attempt to me is, like, that that's that's all that matters it's just really wanting to grow absolutely mm -hmm. for sure uh, so speaking of this writing process was there a track off this album that took longer to write uh, and also do you have a personal favorite they're both the same answer and it's out of oh. sight um, oh okay yeah the opening track of the record was the hardest one to write because i think it's the most um it's definitely the most kind of out there song for us mm -hmm. as a band there's not really a guitar part. I mean, it kind of is, but there's not really guitar parts. There's not really one continuity of a vocal part. There's like at least 10 to 15 vocal tracks on that rep on that song alone. Jesus Christ. Um, there's probably 20 different tracks separate of, of percussion and sounds and just like, um, there's these weird ambiences of just like from my phone when we were recording at my uncle's house when it was raining and all like these leaves and stuff that were outside. Like so cool. there's a bunch of ambience that's buried into it. And I think we kind of knew what we wanted it to be, but it took li literally years to like kind of unlock the, you know, sometimes there's this like disconnect between like the taste like the, the, your taste of something and then your skill set of something. Mm -hmm. And when those things can't match, you're just, 
kind of spinning your wheels, trying to make something and continually trying and trying and trying. And you know that what you hear in your head is not the thing you're producing, Mm -hmm. but you're keep going back, keep going back, keep going back. And it eventually got to a place where we're like, okay, I think this is now the shell of what it should be. And everybody was like, yeah, this sounds great. And then once Zach put a bass part to it, it kind of locked in this whole thing of like, oh, okay, now I can feel where this is supposed to be. And Mm -hmm. it literally took years. I mean, it was like a, uh, a, we started the idea of this, of what we could do in like, yeah, like 2017, 17, 18, something like that. And Mm -hmm. so, I mean, and we spent the better part of those years after that, I get, yeah, I guess 2018 because yes. So yeah, a couple of years of like literally having one little random generating bell sounding riff that Mm -hmm. I knew could be something cool, but it just took a long time for us to really unlock that. And um, once we got it, it, it also completely set the tone for the feeling of the record. Like just, and I'm a big proponent of that, where it's just like when you drop the needle on a record, like that first thing you hear is going to set the tone for everything that happens after that. Yeah. And um, that was one of those moments that when we first heard that, it was like, we've never started a record before where it was just Kyle. And then it's just, it's just loneliness for, you know, a while. Mm-hmm. And there's this really wild um, that that we did on a couple songs in the record where there's this crazy thing where every time that David would kick his kick drum at the end of that song, the entire mix would actually uh, it's called side chaining, but it's like basically chained to this kick drum. So every time he kicked it, the entire mix would duck out and it would just go away. So there's this weird like pumping effect that almost feels really disorienting um it's not an easy listen like when you really like (laughs) listen to it but Mm -hmm. when you put on headphones and really start and it happens the same at the end of mouth too Mm -hmm. where it's just like got this pulsating sound that just gets bigger and bigger and it's almost yeah like kind of disorienting to listen Mm -hmm. to but um that was the vibe we wanted to do and so it took us a really long time to get there but when we got there it was like it, it really paid off for sure I was trying to say, holy shit. Oh, okay. (laughs) I was just going to say, so basically you had this song going for five years, I'm going to say, right? Uh, Maybe not that long, but at least the riff, like the the one that Chad sent over initially was, yeah, somewhere between 2017, 18, somewhere in that that realm, he sent us the idea and was like, I love this, but I don't know what to do with it yet. And I I really, I really am going to keep revisiting it until, until we get there. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like, so from 2017, 2018, you guys were just trying to build that up and kind of find out what you wanted to do with the song. Around like what year did you kind of see the vision and then everybody was like, okay, let's go. We got it. Well, we actually wrote almost a whole record and scrapped the whole thing. Holy um, shit. Uh, so like we, a whole new beast, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, um, we had most, so, okay. So in, I'm, um, Man, I'm now trying to think. Okay, so in 2019, in the summer of 2019, mm-hmm. um, we have some friends that owned a studio in Baltimore. Um, this guy, Brian McTernan and Paul Levitt, are friends of ours that they've recorded countless bands. I mean, they, um, you know, Brian is responsible for all the, you know, early Circus Survive records and oh. Converge, and Paul did, you know, uh all time lows gold record you know platinum record oh. stuff like that so they yeah, yeah. they had a studio that um and they're, you know they were friends of ours that were just like hey we're actually not going to be in the studio for like eight weeks and they gave us the keys they were just like have fun record <laughs> like you have use all the gear use the live room whatever just like have fun so we intended on going in and we probably had like maybe 10 12 ish demos and the idea was like hey we're gonna record this record ourselves let's just do mm-hmm. this um we had all the demos had the songs done um ish i mean they weren't totally done but they were I had a lot of them that that were songs like they were pretty much there and um we went into the studio and started doing like some practicing of stuff and recording and just none of it felt right and mm-hmm. we spent literally eight weeks in there spinning our wheels had nothing to show for it and that winter like that um kind of september 2019 ish we all just were so burnt out Mm -hmm. that we were just like let's uh, let's just scrap all this like we like we spent pretty much right after wait for love up till then writing and it was just like none of this feels right and 
um, we just kind of took a break from everything. Honestly, took a break from even like seeing each other, really. I mean, like we didn't really hang out much those times. Everybody was busy. Everybody had stuff going on. But yeah, we just uh, we just didn't didn't feel like it was there. So we scrapped the whole record and honestly didn't know that we were going to write again. Um, mm -hmm. It just it, it like we really needed something to kind of kick us in the ass again or not even that. I mean, because that's not ever going to help us. But for us, it was like, you know, we needed to be somewhat inspired or at least have some sort of vision of where we wanted to go. And um, early 2020, we were just kind of like, let's let's try this again. Like, but trying it again means like everybody's ideas come to the table. Like we got to literally trash everything that we have written before because everybody already now has spent two years with these demos yeah. and already knows where they think they should go and how they should be finished. And mm -hmm. everybody's on a different page about that. So we just need to scrap everything and start mm -hmm. new. And so we did. And um, pretty much by the time we started writing, the first song we finished for the record was The Days. And that was like kind of the rock song of the record that, we all loved and was like, this is a great, this is a great song, but the production on it, when we record it, I want it to feel less big and, you know, bright and all that stuff. And want it to almost sound like, like a My Bloody Valentine song or something. Like I want it to be super washed out and weird. And by the time we started getting the voice of the record and all of us have like kind of studio setups that we could just toy around with things you know we just basically spent time pulling apart all the demos and putting them back together and eventually got to a place where it was just like okay i think we're in a groove now of writing a lot of weird stuff and yeah. and we had a little call we had this giant whiteboard that we would get through a song and then have a little thing at the end and it was like is it weird enough and then when we get there <laughs> check it off and just be like cool like this is we did it. this is we did it yeah mm -hmm. so um yeah so I think the best thing we could have done was scrapping that whole record and starting over. Um, yeah, it put us back by years, but this is my favorite record we've ever done as a band. And I don't know if I would have been able to say that had we kept all the earlier demos. Hell yeah. Wow. Sure. Oh my God. <laughs> Didn't expect that can of worms to be open. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It didn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe those demos will find the light of day one day. But That's maybe that would be at some very point. Cool. Uh, yes. Yeah. So how'd the track list for this album come about? Did you guys write the opener be the opener, close be a closer? Did you shuffle around, see what fits? What was that process like? A lot of shuffling around. Um, mm -hmm. The sequencing is on all of our records is super intentional, like really intentional about how, why things are moving into like certain places, why things are, um, why this song follows this song, why this song does this song. So mm -hmm. we didn't necessarily write the opener to be the opener or the closer to be the closer, but we're pretty good at knowing what those are going to be pretty early on. Like once we write a song, that's like, Oh yeah, that's, that's the closer of the record. Like we mm -hmm. kind of always know that right as soon as we finish it. And this record was no different pair. As soon as we finished, it was like, yeah, that feels like the way this record should close. Um, it, it, you know, we close a lot of our records with these giant bombastic big endings. And it was like, I kind of want to do something that's not that this mm -hmm. record i want to do something that just kind of drives and just kind of kind of bring like the whole record to me feels like as soon as it, as soon as it starts you're in this like twilight and then as soon as the bass comes in on out of sight mm -hmm. you're taken into like the night and it's you're, you're just through this murkiness of a really long long night until you get to the kind of opening of pair where i feel like you kind of see the sun peeking through and i feel like that mm -hmm. track felt that way to me and it just kind of felt the continuity of everything really really kind of had that going for it so um yeah we toyed around with it a bit but it ended up being kind of you know here and there the same but um for the most part yeah it ended up being uh being a lot of toying around to make sure the center made sense especially on a record when you have to flip it because that yeah. like those two sides are super important how you're starting and ending each side at least for me i don't know how any more with people attention span and stuff like that but i mean for me it's really important i, I okay. respect that you 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 take that into consideration especially oh, yeah. with the age of streaming and everything oh yeah man i mean i feel like yeah i don't know i uh it's a hard thing to turn off for me <laughs> fair enough 
Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so would you be able to tell us where your headspace is at while you're creating this record? Yeah. Um, oh, man. Uh, what time? Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, like, I think, um, honestly, being away at my uncle's house and just writing with everybody mm-hmm. was some of the best times I've had in my life. Like, in, in, in recent memory, I, I mean, it's... Um, we're really lucky as a band that it's like, I know a lot of bands get like their friends and stuff like that. But I mean, like my, my band are my best friends. Like they, they are the people that I, um, I, I know no matter what, that are on my side They're They've always got my back and I don't get to see them that much anymore just cause we all have so much going on, you know, um, three of our members have kids. Some have, have two kids or like two kids. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's just life is different in your mid to late thirties than it was when you're in your late teens, early twenties. So, you know, in the headspace of creating, it was some of the best time of my life. And then um by the time that we were mixing and doing art, kind of all the uh um perfectionisms came out um between myself, everybody. Um, and there were a lot of days that I wanted to put my head straight through a wall. And, um, but I feel like if it doesn't kind of drive you to that, like, uh, you know, what's the point if, if you're not like working, working to the point of that. So, Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, I think my headspace was pretty good. I think I just got into the wall that happens in the winter time after we finally got our, we got our master back and listened to the master and I would listen to it nonstop. And then we kind of basically had to like, you know, it, it didn't come out for almost a year. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're holding on to it for so long. And then you start listening to the master and thinking like, well, fuck, is anybody like, is this, is anybody gonna like this? Like, is this Mm -hmm. bad? Is it good? Is it like, I know I love it, but do I love it? Because like, there's just so much second guessing. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, the older I get, the more I recognize my kind of anxieties and things that, um, really kind of rear their head at times that's like uh, you know you're, you're trying to be as confident about stuff as you can but it's very easy to second guess yourself and mm-hmm. so i think for the most part my headspace is pretty good but definitely moments where i think all of us were kind of in the uh in the lurches with a lot of it and um yeah yeah probably pro- probably for the most part being good but definitely had its moments of of not great <laughs> For sure. Yeah. For sure. Happy to hear the majority was good, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. I mean, creating is always, it's kind of the medicine for me, a lot of stuff, just to get out of my own head. Fair yeah. enough. Uh, so how do you recommend your fans to, to listen to this album for the first time? Should they do it in the car with friends, in the dark with headphones on? Is it a workout album, party album? What do you personally recommend? Uh, me, loud as hell with headphones. Like, <laughs> let's sit, sit down. I mean, it's a short record. It's like less than 40 minutes, sit down with some headphones, turn it up. And I think once you do that, you start picking up nuances that you didn't hear before, like stuff that's really buried in the record that I'm excited to see over the next couple of years, people start hearing stuff that we put in there that I think t- has these weird ties to other songs to like sonics that kind of tie stuff together. There's a lot of really cool little subtleties that I think really just come out the best in headphones um but um definitely not a party record unless you want everybody at the house to you know be really depressed but i think uh um it's a it's a great uh headphones record it's a great loud in the car record i think um yeah i think it can kind of be enjoyed anywhere i think it's just uh you know piecemealing it is something i don't recommend fair enough for sure. <laughs> uh, so this one should be super, super quick off the top of your head. I want you to describe this album for new listeners in three words. No more, no less. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Dreamy. Okay. Um, hazy. Okay. And heavy. And I say heavy in the many, like it can be kind of interpreted in every sense of that word i think yeah. it's a a heavy record sonically at a lot of times even if it's not you know breakdown chugging guitars heavy i think <laughs> yeah. like sonically there's a lot of really heavy moments that are really deep 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then lyrically, I think it's a very, very heavy record too. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. Um, so in that same train of thought, is there a certain feeling or emotion you want your listeners to have while going through the album? No, I want people to sit and just spend time with it. I want them to develop their own relationship with, with what the record should be and what it should sound like. And I, I want, I want people to kind of spend time with it and create their own relationship. Cause I think that's how you end up finding those records that stick with you for a long time is when you have a personal relationship within that record too. That's fair enough. That's very good. Uh, so what is your favorite memory that you made while creating this album? You know, off the, I'll just say off the top of my head, there's this lake called Lake Laura that was right by my uncle's house that David and Chad and I, we we were the only ones left at the cabin because Kyle and Zach had to go home a little early and we were there for like three or four extra days. And we took an afternoon where we just took a backpack full of beer and went down to this lake that had paddle, paddle boats. And Aww. we paid 20 bucks, got on a paddle boat, and really just like, just swam all day and just like listen to music and just hung out together. And it it was, that was kind of like the moment too, where it's just like, we were sitting in the middle of this lake kind of just drifting around, no pun intended, but it really had, (laughs) it really had that feeling where it would like that sitting back and just kind of being alone in this kind of body of water and just nothing happening. You're literally just kind of letting the tide take you and, that that will be forever one of the things that I will just like. It was my probably one of my favorite days we had ever writing, and it was just great to just hang out, be around each other, and just kind of shoot the shit for a while. That's that awesome. Very happy. That sounds like a very very good day. Oh yeah, yeah it was awesome. Um, so picture this: you're on tour, you're at a gas station for a rest stop. What is your snack of choice? Oh, Cliff Bar. Um, I'm vegan, so all the all my uh, gas station snacks are very limited um but my go-to is usually a cliff bar because if i get can't i used to love candy um i still do but there's just very few candies i can get anymore Mm -hmm. but like um cliff bar at least isn't going to make me feel insane because all of us are gonna have like coffee or something in the morning and it's usually on an empty stomach Mm -hmm. so if i do that and then i have like some sort of sugar like my I like start getting jittery and start feeling insane. Yeah. yeah. So a cliff bar at least gives me a little bit of sustenance to hold me, hold me through. And um even though every get time I go to the gas station, it's like, oh cool, this is six bucks now. It's like insane how much a cliff bar can be. But yeah. that's all that's always my choice. And yeah. if it's at well that's in the morning. If it's at night and we stop somewhere that has like a sub station, I'll get mm-hmm. a sub. Like a, oh. a veggie sub and then the uh zaps voodoo chips. Mm-hmm. Those are those are my go tos. All right. What what's the go to Cliff Bar flavor though? The peanut butter, the oh, crunchy sure. peanut butter one. Okay. Only also because I think it has the highest calories, or <laughs> it like. Whereas I know that if I have it, it's gonna hold me until we get to the venue and load in. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, actually, on the topic of tour, who has the ox in the the car? Because as you mentioned earlier, you all have very different music tastes now. Who yep. who who plays the music? Whoever drive, whoever drives, and we have a uh, um, kind of a rotating list also to where um, during the day it's usually not too hard. Somebody will hop in the driver's seat regardless, like mm-hmm. during the day. But you know, we all drink, so at night we have to have like a designated driver's list to okay. know that you know, making sure that you know we're being safe. And so during during the day is kind of the you're probably going to be driving six hours between four and six hours. Mm -hmm. Um, Most people now, funny enough, it's like most people are putting on podcasts or a book. That's how boring we are. Like we'll listen to it. Yeah. Um, uh, And then if everybody's doing that, most of the entire rest of the band is in headphones, listening to the, to their own (laughs) shit. So, um, but yeah, like I'm a, I'm a big like podcast person. Mm -hmm. So I listen to a ton of podcasts. I'm probably the one that annoys everybody the most music taste wise. Cause I I'm, say. yeah, I think that's, that's usually my, I'm, I'm way into electronic music, mm-hmm. um, big into like industrial stuff, techno stuff. So usually my taste is like very pulsing, uh, like heavy 
industrial <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. <laughs> typically nobody is like there at 1030 in the morning, but that's mm-hmm. what they want to listen to. But that's kind of my thing. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I get it, but, um, yeah, it's whoever's driving, they get the, they get the van speakers. Wow. Yeah. Cause my follow-up question was going to be, who's the person that everybody's like, no, 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 don't let him drive. Don't let him drive. Uh, because, but, but that's you. For years, it was also don't let him drive. Like personally, don't let me drive. Um, but it wasn't because <laughs> I shit you. Know, it wasn't because I was a bad driver. Nobody, mm-hmm. everybody just assumed that I wasn't going to be a good driver. So I just <laughs> I, I never I don't know. But hey, I mean, it's not like I complain. I didn't have to drive for like I mean, we, yeah, true. you know, we were on tour for. There was one tour we did in 2010 that was like 60 plus days, Jesus and Christ. I didn't, I didn't drive a single one. So oh, there hey, you go. It was, a, it was, it, it was their fault for not wanting me to drive. Yeah, but you, exactly. you had a um, chauffeur, man. Yep, exactly. So um, I was probably the one that was like, "Don't let him drive." Um, <laughs> but mm-hmm. one night, I can remember specific. We were on tour with Touche More on their headline tour in Texas, mm-hmm. and uh everybody was drinking and i wasn't and i was like i guess it's my night to shine like i guess i have to i have to be the one to drive Mm -hmm. and then obviously i got thrown into the rotation after that and and then i think me i think i became probably the one that drove the most you Um, had to make up for it exactly exactly so that's good that's good uh so loosely on the topic of food uh if the band was a dish what dish would the band be and why Ooh. Hmm. Oh man, that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think of something that we can all at least enjoy. Okay, well, I at least I'll tell you what comes up at least every tour. Uh, I don't know if this would be us necessarily, but I guess it kind of would be. Is that Chad and Zach every tour will do like we always call it? It's like the wing, the wing stop tour, where they'll mm-hmm. just constantly get wings, man. Every place we go they get wings like and it's always the hottest thing that the place offers oh my God. God. So, so they don't finish all, all of it oh they do oh they, huh? they they will oh it's no problem like we all love spicy food too so it's like not a problem at all but they it it's it's pr- pretty much wings pretty non-stop um and then yeah wings and burgers <laughs> and then uh, eventually at that point just being like man i don't feel good but um <laughs> that's yeah. that's that's typically the go-to that's typically the go-to if you're okay. going to a place that offers wings i would assume you eat a lot of like beyond meat and impossible yep. meat on the road yeah yep yeah which is cool with me i yeah. mean that's cool i mean it's way easier to do it now than it was you know 10 years ago when i was yeah. trying to like yeah like yeah it's like when i was trying to tour being vegan in 2011 or 2012 it was like that's... man it was fries for dinner a lot of nights but yeah. mm-hmm. it's gotten way better so i'll take all the beyond stuff they got. oh yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of gas station fruit man. <laughs> yep yep mm. yep um so for the last couple of questions we're gonna shift completely away from music and go straight to death row boom so if you're on death row what would your last meal be with a drink oh uh okay a drink is this thing called a headless horseman that's at um this cocktail bar down the road from us it's scotch yellow chartreuse maraschino liqueur mm. it's one of my f- favorite drinks i've ever had it's incredible that and then um and meal probably uh, actually my yeah my favorite meal would probably be just a killer bon me like that is that's pr- uh, that or pho but like I'm a huge like Vietnamese food is my favorite kind of food, so Rightfully I'd so. probably probably do a killer pho or a uh, or a, a cocktail. Mm-hmm. That's very good pick. Pho is delicious. It's one of my favorites yeah, as well. So good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you could live in one fictional world for a week, where would you live? Oh, damn, that's good too. Um... One fictional world for, uh, you know, honestly, my wife and I play Animal Crossing. I'd, oh, yeah. I'd like, I'd like to live on our island for a week. Nice. Our island's pretty, pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. Nice. A damn Tom Nook. <laughs> I know. God. Always stealing his damn bells, man. That man, yeah, fucking <laughs> guy. Uh, <laughs> so I have the investing last question, and every single person that we've spoken to have said that it is the most important question. Okay. What's your favorite color? Blue. Easy. Ooh. specific shade of blue um i like um 
a like not as dark as navy but like maybe one shade brighter than that like Ooh. that that time when um right when the sun goes like all the way down and the mm -hmm. sky has that like tinge of it's it's like a blue but it's just almost a black blue but not as dark as navy like mm -hmm. right in that in between that's my favorite color nice it's a very good color yeah. oh yeah uh, so as I said, that's all the questions we have today. Is there anything that you would like to plug? Uh, I just hope people listen to the record. Um, we're doing um, our second leg of this U.S. tour. Come, it starts in about a month ish. We're starting in L.A. on the West Coast, um, and we're doing a handful of dates out in the West Coast, a handful of dates in the Midwest and Northeast. So, would love to see people come out. I know there's a lot of shows going on. I know. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's oversaturated and mm -hmm. everybody's got a million choices of where to go now. So <laughs> I hope people come check it out. Uh, we're trying to put on the best show that we can, which I think yeah. we have. Um, and uh, yeah, just listen to the record. Hope you dig it. Listen to it in full and just stick with us. I don't think we're going to go anywhere. So hopefully nobody else does either. Hell yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you for style. It's been Mike from Be Pianos Become the Teeth and we have been the Good Noise Podcast. <laughs>